best mentioned something about it yesterday. Uh, we're also just going to look at it briefly as as we as why. And of course, as she said, uh, they are found worldwide, inhabiting diverse ecological niche. And of course, again, as she said yesterday, tropical rainforests have the highest diversity, because of course, you know, it has also the higher diversity of plant species. Arctic region, she also mentioned that, very low diversity. Desert, of course, have very low diversity, but the Species you'll find in deserts are adapted to drought stress. So this can be a very uh, good research uh, topic or a uh, very good research idea. If you are into genetically modified plants or transgenic plants, and maybe you don't want to directly uh, modify the gene of your plant of interest, but you want to increase tolerance to drought of maybe corn or potatoes or uh, economic significant plant, it might be interesting to isolate endophytes from desert plants and try to uh, inoculate them in your crop of interest. So you see the plant, you've modified the endophyte population of your plant of interest without necessarily modifying the genetics of that plant. So this can be also a way of creating superior plants without necessarily modifying the, the genetic composition because you know there is a very wide debate going on today uh, whether or not GMOs are good for consumption or not. Uh, of course, in the US, GMOs were allowed many years ago. Here in Kenya, it is just last year that GMOs are now allowed, but there's still a very big debate going on whether we should accept them. Some people say uh, maybe they cause cancers, but of course, that is required. It is the politicians speaking, but there's a big debate. But one way in which you can make your plant superior can be to isolate endophytes from a plant that grows in an area of interest and introduce this endophyte. You introduce that character, you don't necessarily uh, modifying the gene. Of interest on that map, as you can see, very little has been done on the African continent. So your work will go a long way to uh, help also put those red dots on the African continent. Very little has been done, as you can see, compared to Europe, uh, America, even South America, at least that is something has been done. Asia, a lot has been done, but in Africa, very little. Actually, uh, that place of the map is East Africa, is Kenya, maybe and Tanzania, is where we've had some work, and South Africa, and maybe Nigeria, but the rest of the continent, very little has been done. So that, that is also an area of interest. Part of the work that you can do can just be to characterize endophytes in Africa, just so that we, it is known that, okay, uh, if this plant has this particular endophyte, it can be found in this place. So that one can also uh, help. All right. Factors influencing endophyte colonization and diversity, host specificity. Of course, some endophytes will only be found in certain plant species, while others will colonize multiple hosts. For your research, endophytes that are specific to certain Plant species are very important because most of the time they can never turn pathogenic. Endophytes that can be found in a multiple uh, of hosts, mostly when you are working on them, also need to know that some uh, often they can become opportunistic plant pathogens and cause diseases. So if you find host specific endophytes, then there can be very good lines of research because often they can never become pathogenic. The ones that have a wide host range are also the ones that normally cause diseases to plants. So if you find a, a, an endophyte that is very specific for a certain plant, uh, it can open a very good line of research because often it is not pathogenic. Environmental factors, and of course that is what will make maybe Arctic regions have a lower diversity of endophytes. So of course it also has a lower diversity of plants. Soil characters, uh, pH, uh, geographical location, altitude, latitude, those ones can affect. Uh, plant traits also can affect, and by plant traits, uh, we talk about things like root exudates and other chemical signals. Many plants, when the seed is about to germinate in the soil, they normally secrete some exudates to protect it 
from pathogens to prevent competition from other plants. And these exudates sometimes are the ones that also attract endophytes to come and colonize or to start growing around the roots. And of course, human activities, agricultural practices and land use. Of course, when you have uh, high, high, high commercial specialized farming, your yield will be high. But because most of the time, this type of farming involves use of uh, phytochemicals to protect your plants, then the endophyte diversity in this farm will be much less compared to uh, normal farming with farmers, with normal organic farming. So also the human activities and most agricultural practice, highly specialized uh, commercialized farming, you will have a lower uh, endophyte diversity compared to uh, compared to uh, normal uh, subsistence farming, you'll have a high diversity. It's the same thing like, for example, the beef industry. Uh, let me just ask, uh, all of you consume beef, right? All of you are vegetarians, you consume beef. Have you, you, have you eaten beef since you came? Yeah. It, it, does it taste the same with the beef back at home? Yes, exactly. That one is because it's the same animal, it's a cow, but because the beef or the cows are raised here, it's different, the cows are raised there. So it means the taste will be different. The microbial flora in those animals will also be different and a lot of other factors. And that one narrows down to human activity. Here, mostly they are grass-fed, they, uh, they walk a lot to look for their own uh, pasture. The cows walk to look for pasture. It is not commercialized inside the uh, Big, big industry, so the taste will be different. You can choose to prefer any, any taste, but it is different showing or meaning that also the composition of microbes is different. It's the same thing with plants. So that will also affect uh, the endophyte diversity. Of course, this one now you know, endophyte colonize various plant tissues, leaves, stems, roots, seeds, flowers, fruits, from my experience, if you want to find the really novel endophytes, go for uh, the unique parts of the plant, like flowers, for example. And if you look at your plot, nobody's talking about flowers. Yeah? We were talking about leaves, bark, stem. But I can assure you, the endophytes you'll find in the flowers will be very, very, very unique. Uh, so it's any part of the plant. And also, since you are looking for that novel microorganism, you can also think about those, those flower parts that you might Actually, not find in the flower, it may be difficult to isolate one, but if you find it, then you are sure that it is very, very unique. <coughs> of course, the leaves will have the highest uh, diversity or the highest frequency of endophytes, and this is because the leaves also have an opening called the stomata, and uh, most of the time, the spores can just enter the leaf internal tissue through the stomata in the spongy mesophyll layer of the leaf. For those who did biology a long time ago. So once you open the stomata, you get into the spongy or the mesophyll, the mesophyll layer. So you find that the leaves have a higher diversity because uh, of the opening called the stomata. Roots. Roots also form a specialized relationship with many plants. Actually, the layer of space around the root is known as the mycorrhiza. And mycorrhiza is basically a combination of fungal hyphae that uh, colonize the root or uh, inhabit the root and they help the plants in absorption of nutrients. So you also find a rich diversity of these endophytes. So they have their mycelia or the fungal strand, some parts inside the root, some parts outside the roots. And the parts that are outside the roots are the ones that help absorb nutrients. Once they absorb this phosphorus and trans locate it or transport it through diffusion or active transport into the parts inside the roots, then the plant can also take up these nutrients uh, through their xylem uh, vessels and transport them to the leaves where or other parts of the plant where it is required. All right? So uh, the xylem vessels or the trachea, they, they help transport like that. And then also in the seeds, the endophytes you find in the seeds are the ones that will also be transmitted from parent to offspring. These ones that you find in the seeds are the ones that most of the time are plant species specific. They cannot be found maybe in a wide 
variety of plants. They'll be finding specific plants. And through evolution, they have co they have had that evolution process with the plant until now they are part and parcel of, of the plant and they are found inside the seed. So if we find seeds also of leaf, it will be important to try and isolate uh, the endophytes there. So tissue-specific endophytes provide unique functions and benefit the host plant, uh, as we have, we have said. Okay, endophyte diversity varies among plant species uh, between the grass, legumes, trees, and shrubs. And for example, for grasses, you'll have symbiotic endophyte that enhance herbivore resistance, like the example I show you, showed you the other day. Uh, or legumes, mostly you'll have those endophytes that form the root nodules, assist, which assist in nitrogen fixation. And uh, for the trees, uh, you'll have the endophytes that contribute to tree health and ecosystem functioning. Plant species endophytes contribute to plant adaptation and ecological interactions. Okay. I removed a lot of other parts based on the Class you had yesterday, some things were repeating themselves and it was not important to repeat them anymore. So endophyte can host plant relationships, which we can also look at that. And so look at endophyte transmission and colonization mechanisms. So endophyte transmission, it can be vertical transmission or horizontal transmission. And this is important because remember we are saying we want to take out an endophyte from a desert plant and introduce it to a, maybe to introduce it to corn to increase to increase the drought resistance. So how do you do it? Uh, so vertically or horizontally. So yeah. So vertical transmission is when uh, the endophyte is inherited from the from the parent and it is transmitted to the offspring. An example is uh, the end of endophyte called uh, Neotyphodium in tall fescue grass. It is transmitted through seeds and vertically inherited by the offspring. And uh, when it is grass, you know that the major function of that endophyte is to protect that grass from consumption with, uh, from herbivores or even insects. Insects that consume grass are also herbivores. Do you normally know say herbivores, what comes into mind are uh, zebra, gazelles. True, they are herbivores, but also they are insects. Uh, that also consume grass that are, are also in that group of uh, herbivores. And then horizontal transmission acquired from the environment. So that runs from the air, soil, or other plant parts, or uh, they can be brought in by bees when bees are pollinating the flowers. It can carry disease spores of an endophyte from one plant to another. And an example is uh, Epicloid uh, in, in ray grass that's acquired from environmental environment and colonizes the plant through leaves. You see, ray grass is also a very important feed, and uh, sometimes they become uh, affected by these endophytes from season to season to deter herbivores from consuming so that it is, it is also preserved. And uh, for, for transmission, you can also use bees uh, or other insects. It can get in through the stomata, that is for horizontal transmission. It can get in through the stomata. Wind can also carry spores from one plant to another and uh, affect that plant. So for me, this horizontal transmission thing is very interesting and important to look at. And also when you want to introduce an endophyte from one plant to, to another. There was a question about that in some of the things are supposed to be, right? There was something about transfer of endophytes. I saw it from this. It was in part one, part two. But it was, it was explained in the video. I haven't gotten time to watch the. It was 47 minutes and that was too long. I haven't gotten time to, to see it. But I hope uh, they explained how also you can transfer endophytes from one plant to another. Okay, and then colonization mechanisms. Now, how do endophytes now? Uh, colonize the plants and most though, most mostly this one will happen when we are talking about horizontal transmission. So it can be passive or active. And in passive the endophyte will enter the plant through wounds or natural 
openings. So the end of it doesn't have to do anything. Just have to be at the right place at the right time, close to the stomata and voila. Or maybe if there is a wound, the end of it score just has to be at the right place at, at the right time and it will launch uh, uh, a relationship that is passive. Active is where by the end of it will produce enzymes or compounds that will aid in e colonization. And this one might include enzymes and these enzymes might be uh, strong enough to cut through maybe the, uh, the cuticle. Remember the leaves of plants are protected by a waxy layer known as the cuticle. So to break through the cuticle, you, may, you must have enzymes that can break uh, the cuticle down. And remember, cuticles are strong, but they're made of uh, strong polysaccharides that are very difficult to break sometimes. So active polarization will will uh, mean that the endophyte has to break the cuticle. Now, when you talk about active colonization of endophytes, I really don't like them because, again, they are the ones that can also become pathogenic. Because disease-causing microorganisms will also uh, use active leaves to attack a plant. They, they'll have to break down. So when your endophyte uh, actively colonizes the plant, don't be so aggressive about it because if things go wrong, then they might become opportunistic uh, pathogens and cause diseases to your plant. So the passive guys will, will be much better. So when you are isolating, these are some of the things you can look at when you are now narrowing down. Maybe you'll isolate 20 uh, microorganisms, 20 fungal species. Now you need to check how does it act, is it active, is it passive, and then maybe you can narrow down to one that uh, does not cause disease, but uh, at the same time has a very important function to the host plant. So what are the plant traits that will affect or aid endophyte uh, colonization? So physical traits uh, like uh, the leaf surface, presence or absence of trichomes. Trichomes are basically uh, hair-like strands that sometimes are found on the leaf surface. They help the leaf to trap uh, air or water and therefore reduces the process of evapotranspiration. So some plants have them, some plants don't have them. Cactus will have millions of trichomes on their leaves. So presence or absence of trichomes, stomatal density. Stomatal density is basically the number of stomata on the, on the leaf. So the more the stomata uh, on the leaf, then the more the openings that the endophyte spores can do or can enter the leaf. Presence of trichomes or, uh, or the uh, cuticle wax on leaves can affect endophyte attachment and colonization. So the trichomes might hold the endophyte spore in place uh, or, or might hold the endophyte spore in place and maybe allow it to enter the leaf through the, the stomata. So the plant itself will, will either aid colonization or not. But also remember, not talking about uh, plant pathology, these ones are also the same factors that will affect whether or not a plant will be affected by a certain disease. So we are, it's, they are more, more or less related. We're not talking about plant pathology, the pathogens that cause diseases to plant. The same factors that affect endophyte colonization are similar to the factors that will affect the ability of a plant to be affected by a, a disease causing pathogen. And that's why I was telling you that the passive guys, the ones that will not need uh, to force their way into the plant, are the ones that, that are the endophytes that you want to be friends with. Okay, chemical traits, secondary metabolites, uh, root exudates, volatile organic compounds. Some plants will produce even metabolites that can attract or repel endophytes. For example, the gum arabica plant. And from the name gum, it, it exudes or it produces some liquid that is sticky and gum-like. So if a spore falls on that, the gum that for the gum arabica plant uh, secretes, then the spore will stay there. And at the right time, the spore will do what? Will find its way inside the plant and colonize the plant. So the reason why I'm insisting on knowing whether the endophyte got into the plant actively or passively is because those ones that get into the plant actively will more likely cause disease in other plants 
And a very good example is an endophyte called Fusarium. And I'm sure you most likely isolate Fusarium from your limb or from your mania. But caution must be taken. Most likely, that Fusarium, nothing much can be done because even if you uh, prepare it, maybe to introduce it to another plant, chances are it might become pathogenic on the other plant. So, you need to look at that. And then chemical traits, as I've given you an example of the gum arabica, the gum that it secretes. Actually, it's the gum that is used to make chewing gum, yeah? It's they're normally extracted from gum arabica. I don't know if you, there are some parts in Mapuni where you can find gum arabica. And um, if you have your, of course, you'll have your scissors or knives to cut the leaves from the plant, yeah? If you use that on the plant, that has gum arabica, you, you injure the stem a little bit, it will secrete some gum. If you collect that gum and just let it uh, sit for some time, two, three hours, you can, and then you can chew, and it's natural uh, chewing gum from gum arabica with a very unique flavor of acacia, because it's from the acacia family. So in northern Kenya, in Tukukana, if you go to those places, it's very dry. Really, uh, and uh, sometimes you find that uh, the kids, when they go to school, the school is a little bit far, so they don't come back home for lunch. Of course, the government now provides lunch in school, but wait, before the government started to provide lunch, so during lunch time, they're just walking around and going to the gum arabica just to catch harvest the gum and <laughs> will be eating. Uh, it's sugary chewing gum, and yeah, so. Those are some of the things you're likely to experience when you work around. But yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's, it's really good chewing gum, very unique taste and natural. Just amazing. So again, that one will also trap endophytes. Yeah, back to endophytes now. It will also trap the spores of endophytes and aid a colonization. Genetic traits, plant genotypes, and genetic compatibility with the specific endophytes. Plant genotypes may have specific receptors or signaling pathways that allow certain endophytes to colonize effectively. There are some plants that will not survive without certain endophytes. Even as human beings, there's very one important microorganisms that we will not survive without. And it's also very dangerous at the same time. Esterestia coli, E. coli, yeah? We all have it in our gut. It does some important roles there. But of course, at times when the concentration is too high, then it becomes sick. So we need it. Because again, sometimes when you eat something, when you wash your hands, when you go and take this, sometimes it's not 100%. So often sometimes as even when you're eating, you might be consuming pathogens. So some of the pathogens that are naturally found inside our gut or the intestinal system helps to do what? To detoxify or kill these other pathogens that, that we consume. All right. Ah, right. So back to what we'll be doing today. So any question up to that point uh, in terms of endophytes? Uh, uh, I think pretty now you, you, are, you are now becoming experts in endophytes. Yeah? You know pretty much what is supposed to be known about endophytes. So any question? All right. So, uh, <clears throat> What we are going to do today is morphological characterization of fungi in the lab. And uh, what is normally important is that you describe the fungi as you see it. So the first thing you need to do is look at your plate, petri dish plate, with the fungi growing inside. The first thing you will notice is the color. At the, and at this point, many fungi look the same always white or if not white, gray or, and then you also look at the reverse. And the importance of looking at the reverse is that you might be dealing with a fungi that secretes certain exudates that are of different colors. So the reverse angle of the plate, or you can say top and bottom, right? Or front and back, that is what I mean. So front is the top and then uh, the bottom, you also look at it. So you find that uh, most of the time after the, the fungal uh, has grown on the PDA, 
the color of the video becomes clear. So as the fungal consumes the carbohydrate, you can easily see the reverse part of the video clearly and see the fungi. And then you need to specify the media. Is it potato dextrose? Is it a uh, malt extract? Is it uh, Canadian leaf? Is it so you need to specify the media? And then you need to measure the diameter of the of the fungal culture. And this is if the we are talking if we are talking about a pure culture whereby it was and that's why when you are plating normally we are advised that you need to plate it at the middle of the plate and also you should measure the diameter. This one will tell you how aggressive is the fungal growing, how fast is it growing because and the age. So the diameter goes hand in hand with the age. So is it seven day old plate? If it is seven day, what is the diameter of the uh, what is the diameter of the culture? Is it 50 millimeters? Is it, is it 20? So those are also keys to start to, to uh, identifying the fungi. And then the most important is to dis you are supposed to describe the fruiting bodies. Or the fruiting bodies are also known as the reproduction structures. Now, fungi are very unique microorganisms. They exhibit what we call an uh, telomorph and an anamorph state. Okay, let me use it like sexual and non asexual cycles. A fungi can reproduce either sexually or asexually. And when they produce sexually, then that state is normally known as telomorph. So it is funny because you might find the same fungus, when it is in, in its sexual state, it will look very different from the very same fungus when it is in a, in a sexual state. So when you isolate, you might isolate the same fungi, you might isolate both the telomorph state of the same fungi or the animal state, the sexual state or the asexual state. So the sexual state is also known as the telomorph state. So normally at that state, the fungal mycelia of two fungi during the sexual state, the fungal mycelia of two fungi attach, and when they, when they touch, the, uh, at that place that they touch, the, uh, what, the cell will break, and then they can exchange their cytoplasmic uh, material and the nucleic uh, material. And then now they can be transformed, genetic material from one uh, fungus to another. Normally the result is that your plate that has a fungal that uh, has gone to sexual state will have what is called sectoring. You will have different colors, it is not contaminated, it is the same plate, but you have different colors and different parts of the plate. So that one can be used to tell that, okay, this fungus maybe is going through uh, the sexual reproductive cycle. So when you see color, it could identify being sexually, basically? Or it's color just? Now, normally, uh, normally you can only tell that molecularly, using molecular, but when your plates have sectoring, but by sector, I mean there are areas that are maybe whitish, other areas are gray in color. Then, rather than suspect uh, uh, contamination, sometimes it can be an indication that that fungus is going through sexual cycle. And if you isolate the DNA from that part that has a different color from another, then you may find that the DNA compositions are different at that point. So it's like you have two organisms in one plate, but maybe you started with one. But at some point, maybe due to plate condition, it was it was switched from a sexual to sexual state. So that is something that uh, is very important uh, just to know from a mycological point of view that fungus behave like that. Organisms like bacteria, most of the time, it's very easy. Cell division, simple story. They divide like that. That is how they produce. For fungi, they, pro they produce what now are called spores. And those spores are produced through the reproduction structures. In fungi, we, know, we call them the fruiting bodies. That is the term we use to describe the reproduction. And these ones are the ones that will tell you, tell you apart different microorganisms. So these ones are good, these ones are important. And also like even for your reports and your publications, these ones are good. But this is the most important in trying to tell the fungi apart. And uh, I'll give you some examples. So this is what you are expected to do today. Uh, now this is the front, as I was saying, reverse, and the spore. fruiting body, or, or the spore, yes. So this one is uh, Aspergillus uh, glaucus. It's an endophyte in maize. 
You can also find it and not be surprised if you isolate it in your in your name and whatnot. So the front, the description, you describe what you see. Green with a whitish periphery. The good news with uh, fungi, nobody really, as in you can use colors like whitish, grayish, it's allowed in this case, because the colors are not very clear. So this is the only place where you can say whitish and be accepted significantly. So you describe what you see. And if you look at it, uh, there are even some ridges. I don't know if you cannot see it clearly, but you can see that all those things should go into the description. So uh, use words like maybe sometimes suede, mycelia, whitish, uh, with a, uh, maybe this is green, the whitish, very fair. And then the reverse is green. That is, yeah, you cannot see it's green. And then colony diameter, so you measure with a, a ruler in uh, millimeters, and then you record. But now this one, colony diameter, need to go with days. How old is this culture? In this case, it is seven days old. So is it that is that normal for this particular fungal species to grow slowly or to grow aggressively? And then now you describe what you see there at the fruiting body. So uh, for spadulas, we normally call uh, we call their spores conidia. So this long one is a conidiophore. So long and smooth walled conidiophore. And then maybe you can go ahead and see that conidia and you can see maybe chains of conidia. So you describe everything you see. So at this point in time, we will not have this. We don't have the species name. So what we have are the descriptions. And I say that these descriptions are important because already once we, we know, we've seen the conidio four, and then we've seen the long and smooth, then we know that most likely this banger comes from the class uh, basidiomycota, or maybe ascomycota. And once we know it is ascomycota, then now we can know that to identify it, the best primers we need are maybe ITS or elongation factor. So this one will just help you to choose on the primers that you use on your molecular work, this morphological identification. It is difficult, it is tedious. Many labs today don't do it. We just go straight to the molecular work, then we work backwards, makes, makes it easier. But this one is good because it helps in uh, uh, choosing on your primers. But in the more advanced labs whereby you can use several primers at the same time, where we, can, where we have nested PCRs, then you might not need to do the uh, morphological uh, identification. But since you are interested in trying to isolate a very novel endophyte, then I think this is very important for your case, the morphological identification is also very, uh, very important. Another example, well, this is also aspergillus, but a different aspergillus, aspergillus very scalar, also an endophyte that uh, is found in maize. You can also find it, I won't be surprised if you find it in your name. And you can see the term front, uh, you can use words like that, fluffy, all right? It's allowed. What, just describe what you see. In description of your media, there is not, no right or uh, wrong. Just describe it as, as you see. Because the reason why it is open-ended, you might be describing a very new microorganism for the very first time. So you don't have to, it, it doesn't have to be similar to what someone else described. So it is open. So describe it as, as you see. If you see fluffy, say fluffy, like maybe fluffy, like the cats. Huh? The cats are normally fluffy sometimes. Some. So you say fluffy, suede, whatever you see is what you describe. And it's allowed because you might be talking about a very new microbe that has never been isolated before. Yellowish brown. So uh, again, that is the color inside there. So it's allowed to have a mixture of colors. And then you just describe it as, as you see. Someone maybe will say yellowish, it's okay, yellowish brown. Yellowish brownish is okay with the white periphery. So again, that one, so it is, this one also means it is related to this first one because see also this one had a white periphery. So that one, again, you can now start relating them already. So when you are grouping them, maybe you can group this with that together. Then you say all the fungus with white peripheries, group A. And most likely you find that they are the same genus. Reverse cream, the diameter, and then also you describe the you describe the conidiophore. And in this case, you can also say that the conidia head 
is supported with two conidia. All right, so you can see it's supported with two or or or, or most of conidia. So these photos you can take even using your phone. These ones, this one, the front and the back. But that last one, there's a microscope there that has uh, a, a camera of sorts. So once you prepare the slide, uh, uh, we'll show you as the author force has done so, so many times. So, so, so what I expect of you, at least for the cultures you'll have, have a, a photo, front photo, the description, reverse photo, and then also a slide photo. And then you put that description together and then you'll isolate the DNA tomorrow from those uh, fungal uh, cultures, and then you will carry that DNA with you. You go and do PCR. Uh, when you go to Arizona, you go and do polymerase reaction. And then after you do PCR, you will sequence. And then after you sequence, you will blast them. And then now from the blast data, you can now say, okay, it is 99% similar to Aspergillus veriscola. So therefore, it must be Aspergillus veriscola. And then now also that one, you will also add that now to this data of morphological identification because again uh, this one also the fruiting body this is specific for aspergillus you cannot say that it is aspergillus before seeing the the fruiting body so this is the most important the the microscopic fruiting body structure of the fungus but these are these ones are also beautiful that they take so they're also nice so you have to also include them plus they form part of uh, Another example, you know, these are totally different uh, fungus, and I bet you will get this one. Fusarium, you will get fusarium in your name. This one for sure you will get. So front, whitish, violet, okay? Reverse, orange. Cunning diameter, 55. So you can see this one is more aggressive compared to the, to the aspergillus. And then now for, for fusarium, they don't have conidium. So also describe what you see. Fusarium don't have conidiophores or sporangiophores. They have now what is called uh, microconidia. So in your case, maybe since, uh, but the good thing, you, the, 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 the one name that can be used for all of them is conidia. So you can use, as you're describing this, you can use the, the term, the conidia, then now we'll correct. So if you see this, then you know that that one is fusarium. So microconidia and then, uh, at the microscope level, you see it clearly, you describe it. So in this case, septate with food-shaped basal cells. So this one, if you look at it closely in the microscope, you see that it has some septa, or it is not one straight, it has some divisions, and then that's why we call septate. And then the microconidia, the small ones like this one, no septation, it is not septate, and then the shape is clavate in shape. And then chlamydiospores are upset. So that is how we Could you explain the macro and the micro again? Macroconidia are the large ones, like for example, this photo. These are macroconidia, macroconidia, then the microconidia, the small ones, like this one, and uh, like uh, that one. So it's very clear when you observe it uh, under a microscope rather than here. So you describe what you see. Does it have septation? Does it not have septation? And then uh, chlamydia spores are present or absent. So there are some fungal species like Fusarium, for example. If you see the macroconidia and the microconidia, then no doubt that you are sure that it's a Fusarium. But of course, you don't know which species it is, but you know that it's a Fusarium. The same thing that uh, also happens when you see Penicillium. Penicillium, you see what is called a witch's broom. Eh? You watched Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> you see that broom that the witches drive it. So the fruiting bodies for penicillium looks exactly like that. So you see that, no doubt you're sure they're talking about penicillium. So uh, different fungus have different for as for aspergillus is that uh, club like you see that this one looks like a club, yeah. But you can use to hit not necessarily the baseball club, but uh yeah, that's, it looks like a club. So if you see that, then you know that that one is aspergillus. So of course, you'll not be able to tell the species name until after molecular work. But morphological identification can be used to identify up to the genus, genus level. And of course, it also goes hand, hand in hand with, with, the, with the colors. Like uh, for, for Fusaria, most of the cultures will be this violet, and then orange at the back. 
Yeah, even this one, this is fusarium, and you can see the cold diameter is sixty-two, very aggressive, and then violet at the back. For sure, you will meet some fusarium at the end of it. You you will isolate. Uh, so again, macroconidia, the large one. And at least this one, you can see the septation clearly. I hope the small lines there. That is the septation. It described as you see slightly slender, slightly slender, yeah. And then okay, so some of these are some of the also other fungal species we are likely to encounter. Uh, so the front, and you can see this one is uh, also very fluffy, reverse, and then you see uh, the microconidia or the. So you can just say this one. How do you describe this one, for example? Which one? Oh. The, the, the microscopic appearance of the fruiting bodies. Uh, Cylindrical. Yeah. yeah. Cylindrical conidia. Okay. Observed. And uh, maybe you see, I don't know if there's a septation here. Uh, septed cylindrical conidia. Okay. Just how you see it. No, no, right or wrong. The color here is it flat? Is it not? And you can see from the name cylindrical. Yes, so you are likely to also uh, isolate that one. So this one has not been explored a lot. It has a lot of secondary metabolites, so it might be interesting to see uh, what secondary metabolites it can produce. Okay. Chitomium, also you're likely to see this one. So the front, who can describe the front, for example, from that picture? Fluffy. Uh-huh, fluffy, yes. Color whitish, maybe, uh, and then the reverse. Orange. Uh huh. Beige. Yes, orange beige. Yes, yes. And then you measure the the diameter in, in millimeters, and then you uh, you also correlate that with the age. And then the microscopic appearance. Uh, actually, you normally say what you see. Me, I'll say lemon shaped, maybe. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Ah. Or oval, ovoid, you can use oval, ovoid, okay. Uh, they are clustered, you can say clustered, ovoid, so that is how you do it. So it, does, it doesn't have a, a, a specific formula, you just write down what you observe. Because remember, you might be observing that you are observing for the first time in the world. So in that case, really you are the one who knows what you are, what you are seeing. And it will be accepted even if you go to, uh, to publish it in a high impact factor scientific journal, it will be accepted. Whitish, if you, if you look at the all journals that have endophytes, uh, all publications, and maybe that they are describing the fungus or the bacteria, you'll see like the color like this whitish, creamish. Of course, you know, we don't have a color that is whitish, it's either white or it's not. <laughs> yeah, but. And it, this is a, at this point it's allowed, yeah, because it might be a color between colors because of the different exudates that the uh, the fungus is producing. All right, uh -huh. Okay, this is going to describe what this is there. Yeah. Wait, so I have a question for me. Is it would this be considered like the sexual thing because it has two colors on it? Uh, actually, for sectoring, normally sectoring the two colors will be like at a part like this here to here. This one might be whitish, and then you get to this part is a different color, violet. But this one is not necessarily sectoring. Sectoring is a sector on the plate. It's so like maybe here or that other side. Okay. Yeah. And plus this one, you see this one, this one is might might be the media from the previous plate as they were transferring because you'll be you will be shown as you'll be subculturing, you sometimes you cut out the media. So after some time that media from the previous plate becomes darkish. So really if you you describe us you describe that. But maybe also because maybe when they were transferring, they did not do it uh, efficiently because normally you're supposed to just subculture. Uh, a strand of the mycelia if you if you can find so that you have a very clean plate uh, 
there's something like this. You see, in this case, it was just a very small, mm-hmm. it even, yeah, so this is a better transfer. Okay, we are describing what this guy here is. Color, front color. Uh-huh. All right, reverse color. And then microscopic appearance. Looks like beetles. <laughs> yeah, you can use beetle shapes. Septet, huh? yeah. because of the now, but now in things like septet, because you can clearly see that uh, they are different. They are, I and mean, maybe the, the middle one is much more larger, something like that. So we just describe what what you see, and then also there is this sporangiophore or conidiophore. So you describe it smooth, walled, long. All right, and then this one also, uh, my senior sterella. This one, I also bet most likely you also see it. My senior sterella, you also see this so fluffy or hairy. Uh, my pronidia with this, this like a ring, yeah, with, with rings of uh, darkish, fluffy growths. And you can see it's like a ring because you can also see it from the from the reverse side. And then you describe that uh, the orange and the maybe whitish periphery. And then uh, you can see the different branches or branch conidiophore or branch sporangiophore there. All right. But necessarily there are no spores already. Uh, you cannot now see the conidia or the spores of that one. But you describe this uh, the branching there. So something like that. So that is what uh, you will do today. So we are going to prepare pure cultures, number one. And these pure cultures, we're going to use a plate that were previously prepared by Fossa and Lois, so that we just uh, learn how to make pure cultures, which, uh, as I said, we might need that skill next week when you come back from the field as we're preparing your plates. We say that first, before you introduce them to the slants, we will first of all want to isolate them on a petri dish so that you have so that you introduce pure cultures to the slant. So to do it, the first thing, uh, we're going to make uh, pure cultures, and then uh, you're also going to make uh, describe. You're going to do morphological description whereby you describe the front, reverse, and the microscopic appearance. Again, you use uh, plates that were previously prepared by the Fossa. And uh, because you are about it grown. You see, the description is done at least seven, eight days uh, old. So we are going to use plates that uh, they give. But for those plates, uh, they are the ones that also you're going to use to isolate your DNA tomorrow. So you just be careful that you don't finish all the mycelia. This is, this is what I call mycelia, these spangled strands. These are the ones that you'll harvest tomorrow for DNA. Isolation. So some people can start with uh, pure culture preparation. Others who can start with the uh, description of of plates. And it's yeah, a lot of work. taking photos, taking preparing slides. We will also show you that. Uh, do we have a protocol for like slide preparation? Request. Okay, when you go to the lab, we'll give you a protocol of thoughts uh, for for the activities in the lab. I think now it's time for yes, it's time for tea. Then after tea, we'll follow it down there in the lab. Now tomorrow uh, again, unfortunately or fortunately for me, unfortunately because now we have to come in at eight. <laughs> We have to come in at 8 and then uh, to hear from Betsy. So I suggest that if you have not forwarded your assignment, please forward them today, so that at least when she will be talking to us tomorrow, she will have gone through the assignment, and then if she has comments, she can give us a comment. So forward that today. And then uh, after that, after talk from her, we will go again straight to the lab for DNA. Any question? Thank you.
Perfect. Time for tea. And again, uh, they were saying that tomorrow they serve lunch. They, they, they wanted to serve lunch at 11. I've told them that we prefer to eat lunch at the normal time. I don't know if it's okay with all of you. Or you want early lunch tomorrow. Cool. The, 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 cool. the other team will be going somewhere. So that's why they're having their lunch. And since we will be I've just told them that we stick to our normal schedule.